Hi everyone, um, welcome to the first recorded presentation of History 4 458, The Civil War. Um, I'm Phil Travis, um, I'm your professor for the course. Um, I'm going to do these brief presentations uh, at the beginning of each week. They'll typically range 10 to 15 minutes, but as those of you who have taken my classes know, know that sometimes um, I will go into greater depth. Um, today I just want to give a brief, short presentation on some of the basic um, factors in the origins of the Civil War. These are basic, this is a general overview, and much of this stuff is drawn from your reading assignment for this week, Chapter 1 from the uh, McPherson book. Also, by the way, um, that's the Battle Cry of Freedom, the big one. Uh, by the way, I know Battle Cry of Freedom is a huge book. Um, and if you look at the syllabus, you'll see that you're asked to read, to read selected title, to selected chapters in the book. So you're not expected to read all 1,000 pages or however many it may be. But I selected Battle Cry of Freedom because it is the best book on the Civil War, and it is the most thorough book on the Civil War. And so I thought it would be a good kind of desk reference for you to have um, in the class and for the future. Um, okay. So first... Um, I want you to take a look at at this painting, which is by Norman Gast. Of course, it's a 1872 uh, painting. It's titled American Progress. Um, and, of course, it's depicting manifest destiny of the Democratic-Republican era, um, running from Thomas Jefferson through um, President James K. Polk. Um, take a look at this and think to yourself, what does this piece of artwork symbolize? What does it communicate to you? What do you see here? Well, you see a lot of the characteristics of the things that we're going to talk about today factors that are incredibly significant when it comes to the development of the Civil War. Um, this pertains to developments in the United States, developments relating to industrial capitalism, developments relating to transportation, developments relating to the expansion of the country um, for, um, for economic reasons, um, as well as reasons of, of, um, of resources and, and, and territorial strength and foreign policy as well. But... Uh, um, it tells you a lot about how the United States ex it envisioned its expansionist moment. In particular, I think it points out a few characteristics of America at mid-century, um, that, that gas painting, that is. It, it shows that America envisioned itself as expansionist. It was expansionist, of course. Um, destinarian. Uh, it believed it had a destiny to expand across the continent against um, um, other peoples, uh, Native Americans, that it certainly saw as, as lesser. It was Christian and Protestant. It was white. Um, this expansionist tendency in the United States really began with, with Thomas Jefferson, who uh, here is a, is a famous painting of Jefferson, um, and it really began with the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase, of course, opened up a massive section of, of, of the continent um, as Jefferson purchased the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte of France, um, for an incredibly low price. Um, and the territory, uh, the territory um, pretty much doubled the size of the United States. Um, the United States would, uh, throughout the first half of the 1800s, um, have a significantly growing population as immigrants came to the United States from places like Europe, looking to farm, looking for other opportunities, and the new territories opened up immigration out west. And you will see this immigration for uh, pursuit of, of, um, of personal advancement. Um, this, is a f this expansion is a fundamental part of the ingredients that go into causing the Civil War. Another major area of expansion occurred during the presidency of James K. Polk, who was president from 1845 to 1849. Um, and, of course, Polk um, effectively instigated the Mexican-American War 
Um, Mexico was a was a was a very weak, fledgling country at the time. Had very difficult political situations. It could hardly control the territories of Texas and California, and uh, of course, um, the Texans had revolted in 1836. But uh, successive presidents had refused to annex Texas. However, there was a great deal of pressure in the United States as Americans moved increasingly moved west into territories like Texas, um, and as these areas seemed more and more uh, opportunistic in value for the United States, um, and Polk um, effectively um, incited the war with Mexico over tensions after he sent General Zachary Taylor um, to, to the disputed border of Texas. Um, in the Mexican-American War, of course, the United States um, took pretty much all of the southwestern territories, um, Texas and California, or what would become Arizona and New Mexico. Polk also was responsible for agreeing uh, a treaty with the British to act to acquire or to to uh, demarcate really the Pacific Northwest territories um, with the current northern border of Canada and Washington State, um, Polk was an expansionist. He was an opportunist as a president, and he did feel that um, the expansionism was being demanded by the people, but that it was also in the best interest of the United States. Um, and the United States very much took um, its manifest destiny in acquiring lands in the American Southwest uh, for its own opportunity and its own gain. These types of expansionism really, in some cases, uh, operated as a safety valve for coming, America, to coming immigration to the United States, but they also provided the catalyst for um, a major controversy in the United States. So this map basically shows you the territorial expansion um, of, from this era. Um, you can see the, the huge territories acquired and uh, the expansion into these territories will immediately spark in the United States um, sectional crises that lead to the Civil War. The consequences of expansion, um, sectional tension over slavery. Um, you might hear some people at times say things like the Civil War wasn't about slavery, it was about politics. Um, it was certainly about representation in Congress, but these issues were always, always centered around the issue of preserving um, or limiting the scope of the slave system. So slavery was consistently at the heart of the causes of the Civil War. Um, with each new state from these western territories, the state would, there would be a debate over whether or not the state would be slave or free. Um, and s throughout the mid-century period, southern states sought to maintain a balance um, in which there was no complete majority over slave states in Congress. And in particular, the Senate by the 1850s was the key for the southern states because, of course, every state has two senators. And so southerners believed that if they could maintain a balance of southern slave states versus northern states, they could always um, take action to prevent um, any kind of action that could um, prevent the, um, the continuation of the slave system in southern states. Um, the first controversy, oh, the major controversy over a free or a slave state came with Missouri in 1820. Um, and this resulted in, after Missouri um, sought admittance to the Union in 1820, um, there was a huge debate and a fight over whether or not Missouri would be admitted as a slave state or a free state. Um, Henry Clay famously was involved in the, in the debate and famously um, created the so-called Missouri Compromise. And the Missouri Compromise basically demarcated northern and slave, uh, northern and southern um, slave and free areas. According to the Missouri Compromise, Missouri, which had had a large amount of slave owners um, ultimately desire to move to, this, to the area, um, Missouri entered the Union as a slave state. But until that point, the southern border of Missouri, which was the 3630 line, um, would be the northernmost border from which a slave state could be. So Mur Missouri would be this exception to the rule that they would be above the 3630 line and allowed to be in with slaves, but no other state admitted, new state admitted to the Union could be above the 3630 line and have slaves. Um, and so this was this demarcation 
really was for, until the 1850s, the kind of um, reference to whether or not states would come in slave or free. Um, there was a second compromise after the Mexican-American War over California, in which California um, sought admittance as a free state, um, and Southerners and, uh, and, and Northerners again fought over the admittance of California. Um, uh, Southerners created a compromise with Henry Clay again and Daniel Webster as well to allow California in as a free state, but um, uh, to also uh, have the legislation accompanied with a more stringent fugitive slave law. Um, Slavery was increasingly, at mid-century, slavery was increasingly challenged by abolitionists and also free laborers. Increasingly in the United States, by mid-century, um, industrial capitalism, as we'll look at in the next slide, industrial capitalism was really uh, transforming American uh, society. And uh, increasingly you saw the development of, of, of wage labor and uh, the idea that all men, the idea that all men should have a right to, 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 to work for a wage in uh, pursuit of the American dream became um, a very, very widely held view, particularly in the Midwest and in the North, um, by individuals like Abraham Lincoln. And it became a primary um, uh, ideological attack on slavery as slavery in the South increasingly became a peculiar institution. Um, it was a case of an institution that was based in bondage in a, in a country that was increasingly being defined by free wage labor. Um, slavery was defended in the South largely as protecting white Southern economy and culture, meaning uh, you know something like 75% of Southern, uh, the Southern population did not own slaves, but yet defended the institution. Um, and the vast majority of Southerners were not large slave owners. Uh, but also would defend the institution in the Civil War. And one of the big questions is why did this happen? And um, many Southerners, um, the, the slave-owning status quo, uh, encouraged Southerners to defend the South in the slave system because of the belief that slavery was fundamental to the Southern economy and that it protected uh, white Southern culture. So it's defended in the South as good, attacked in the North as bad. Um, so expansion resulted in a sectional cons uh, a sectional um, controversy um, over the tenets of of protecting or even expanding the slave system over those of promoting and expanding the free labor system um, so as the country expanded as it pursued this manifest destiny um, it uh it, it, it created increasing problems over the issue of the expansion or limitation of the slave system. And uh, ultimately, in the middle of the 1850s, when the Missouri Compromise was effectively, um, uh, was effectively done away with, um, the, uh, the new states of, of areas like Kansas particularly became battlegrounds in which Southerners and Northerners, pro-slave and, 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 and anti-slave, um, actually did battle over whether or not new states would come in as slave or free. And these battles were, were, were in the broader perspective, they were about um, taking measures to either protect the um, slave institution politically or to take measures to slowly end the slave institution. So expansion leads to, it creates a powder keg in which sectional tension over slavery and free labor were, um, were carried out in, in the admission of new states. So expansion was like a safety valve in one respect. It, it created a place for immigrants to go. It created new opportunities in the United States. Um, but it was also um, a place in which um, um, sectional conflict um, uh, sectional conflict over slavery was really exacerbated to a point uh, in which the nation ultimately went to war. Last slide. Um, America at mid-century was a very new place when you were to compare it to the kind of agrarian republic that was envisioned by founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Um, during the mid-century period, you, you saw a transportation revolution with steam power 
if you look, think back to that gassed uh, painting, you see the steam engines going across the, 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 the open plains there. Steam power revolutionized transportation in the United States, and it revolutionized the economy in the United States. Steamboats used things like the Erie Canal that ultimately connected the cotton-producing south to the textile-producing north. Um, so it was an economic boom. Um, there was a communication revolution with developments like the telegraph. There was a manufacturing revolution with the development of interchangeable parts that um, um, was originally actually um, developed uh, for the military for, for using for, for muskets, but became a revolution when it came to manufacturing in the United States. There was a growth of city jobs, textile jobs, um, growth of population, growth of wage earning. And very much this resulted in the birth of what we would call free labor industrial capitalism. In the South, farmers were increasingly specialized as well, and cotton became a very, very significant Deep South product. And actually, they, they, it came to be known as Cotton Kingdom. Cotton fueled the textile industry in Britain as well as in the Northeast of the United States. And it became such a powerful economic force, um, the cotton industry did, that um, Southerners on the outset of the, of the Civil War thought it would be impossible to wage a war against the South because international powers and whatnot needed cotton so much that, it would, that it, they wouldn't stand for a war with the South. Um, of course, that was a huge exaggeration, but nonetheless, cotton became a huge industry in the South and a massive boom for Southern farmers. Um, of course, the... U.S. North American slave population, which farmed this cotton, was very unique compared to other institutions of slavery in the hemisphere because, of course, um, slavery in South America, in the Caribbean, had relied almost exclusively on the slave trade, which had been increasingly abolished in the 1800s, um, causing those slave institutions to dwindle and fade to and give way to um, cheaper for, or other forms of servant labor. Uh, in the United States, the, the Southern slave institution continued to function and grow because the slave populations were encouraged to form families, and the actual slave population in the South became self-sustaining. Self and so the slave system in the South was entrenched at a time in which other areas of the Americas, it was slowly and naturally fading away. And so the entrenchment of the, of the, of the Southern slave system encouraged Southerners to um, defend and fight and protect the slave institution, which it saw as absolutely integral to its economics, and it encouraged abolitionists and free laborers um, in the northern section to fight for its limitation and, uh, and, and in many cases, its, 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 its end as a system. Um, Mid-century America, by the way, also changed life for, for women. Um, women increasingly were encouraged, at least non-working class women, were encouraged to um, lead, li lead domestic lives. Um, workers and women both had their lives fundamentally changed by the, by the, um, uh, by the birth of industrial capitalism. Um, laborers were barred, for example, from drinking at work. Um, laborers had to, uh, had to follow very regimented and strict rules and hours. Um, these were all very new developments. They had to work in different environments, um, and, and these were new de developments in life of American, um, um, in, in life of, in America at this time. And women, too, who had often um, fulfilled various jobs inside and outside of the home were increasingly encouraged to take on domestic roles as men became, wor as men worked in the industrial capitalist system outside of the home. So you can see how, I hope, how expansionism during this time period, um, as well as an expansionism that was linked to other fundamental changes in transportation and communication, in, um, in labor and in manufacturing, um, how these all worked to create this sectional conflict in the United States. Um, the Civil War is, is, is really caused by a polarizing sectional crisis in which one part of the country was fundamentally developing around um, 
free labor, industrial capitalism, and fundamentally developing around the idea of, of expanding the free labor um, realm and limiting and eliminating ultimately the slave system, while as another element of, of, of the society was far less industrialized in the South, relied largely on, on, um, uh, on, on farm products like cotton and a slave system. And, and, and how these two fundamental differences clashed. And when you saw the country expanding and adding more and more states, these clashes were only increasingly exacerbated as, as Northerners attempted to take measures to eliminate the slave system and Southerners took me measures to either, um, to, either, to either expand the slave system or to at, at, at least insulate it from its own destruction, which they saw as fundamental to their economic growth. And so expansion tied with economic growth and immigration in the United States um, also exacerbated sectional tensions in the United States that led to um, ultimately to the Civil War. All right, I hope this is hel helpful. Thanks, guys.